Hey guys, it's CL, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I make brand new Critical Role recaps every Monday at noon, and would be happy to have you join the party. If you haven't already, please go ahead and subscribe, and hit the Bertrand bell to be notified of future videos. Now, without further ado, let's discuss the 27th episode of Campaign 3 of Critical Role. I love episodes like these. When our cast of colorful characters are just trying to process everything that's going on around them in the world. These campfire confessionals, as I've been calling them, are some of the purest forms of roleplay, and I really enjoy the dynamics that are birthed from these conversations. Imogen and Laudna decide it's finally time to bury the hatchet, but before that can happen, Dusk pulls aside our human creepypasta and asks her on a date. Laudna says she'll think about it, but later when she finally goes to speak with her violet-haired friend, she says that that side of her hasn't been alive in 50 years. So she's leaning towards no. Before we get to the moment we've all been waiting for, though, Oram pulls Dusk aside and tries to suss out where her fighting style may be from in a sparring match. Oram swiftly manages to swipe five hits on the elf, and the fey ish person is so impressed she asks the halfling out. Though, he sadly rejects her, revealing he's only attracted to men. It's okay, Dusk. You'll find love someday. Even though I probably shouldn't be rooting for you, and this is all a ploy anyway to fall into Fern's good graces. Finally, our favorite pair of witches make up and Imogen gifts her friend the snake ring she purchased during their investigation on Treshy. But just when you think all is right in the world, they decide to keep on the fake argument just for FCG so they can have a chance to therapize them. But Fresh Cut Grass has a lot going on. With the revelation that Dancer is still kicking, swirling around in their metal dome, the girls are quick to feign reconciliation just in the hopes of cheering them up. FCG doesn't seem to be glitching, necessarily, but when Imogen asks what Dancer looked like, there's almost a mistrust there, a hesitance, like they're hiding something. Imogen asks Fern to keep an eye on the automaton during her watch with Chetney that night, and I think we were all holding our collective breaths to see if the will they or won't they would come to anything. They did grow a bit closer, I think. Chetney shows off the woodwork he's been progressing on the music box, and... Fern creepily checks in on FCG and braids their hair wires. Chetney also gifts Fern a wolf, you know, because he wants to fuck her. But he also shares that he sort of picked up on something about the letters that were sent to her by her parents. It's all in one handwriting, sure, but the cards have been painted by hand and are original pieces. I think we're all questioning whether or not this could be Grandma Mori who made them, which Fern denies. But she does trust him enough to show the gnome a small green gem, enchanted in some way and etched in some runes. She's supposed to give it to her parents when she meets them again to quote-unquote save the world. I'm sorry, but this whole thing sounds super ominous to me. Is it just me who's worried? The next morning, Bell's Hells go to pick up their explosives from Esmer, and Fern tries to buy Mr. a pepper box. Sadly, the weapon of chaos is too large for the chimp's hands, and the group leaves Sans' bad idea, but not before Imogen pulls Esmer aside to question whether Letters was telling the truth about their former master dancer. After discerning the truth that yes, she is indeed Harry, the group splits and Ashton is joined by Chetney, Dusk with a transformed fern in her pocket, and Laudna as they head to the Seat of Disdain. <laughs> Every time to talk to General Ratanish about potentially taking up work with the Paragon's call. However, when they arrive and speak with the man, he says that Ashton has indeed proved themselves, but the rest of the crew needs to be tested by a purview far above his own. Out walks the rumored leader of the Paragon's call, Otahun Thule, a woman with tight leather armor, a long cape and a side puff thing, gray hair pulled to the side. Is this ringing any bells for anyone? Though they aren't able to prove it 100% in-game, Marisha freaks over the fact that Imogen's moon lady is standing in front of them. Odahun Thule is a sort of legend in the area. She was tactful and masterful in combat during the Apex War, one of the greats under the Stratos throne. 
However, after the war ended, she disappeared, only resurfacing recently. Interesting. I guess her hiatus was spent on the dark side of Ruidus. But doing what, exactly? Odahun gives the group the option to either fight two of her chosen champions, or the path that they're obviously going to choose, have a crawler race, starting at the bone tree at dusk. If they manage to live, even win, dare I say, the quartet can earn their spot in Rattanish's ranks. They received the emblem of the Paragon's call to get a rental crawler, but before they could walk away, Fern, oh Fern, decides to be Fern. In her rat state, she scurries up the back of Odohun's armor to find out what's going on under her cape and in her puffball things. We still don't know exactly. Ashley rolled an arcana check on a weird tubey contraption, but it was a whisper. So what do you guys think it does? Is that her way to Ruidus? And every time she travels there or scries there, maybe that's when Imogen has dreams of her? After the rat is barely able to escape, Dusk stopping her from being squashed by claiming she was her pet rat named Poots, Ashton and Laudna head back to the All Mines Burn, to set up some kind of plan for the race, Laudna being gifted a strange powder to potentially join the hive mind. They rejoin their friends at Imahara Joe's to retrieve their two crawlers and begin their planning as what to do when they reach the bone tree. What did you guys think of the episode? What is Otohan doing on the face of Ruidus? I love how everything is so interconnected. The face shit is tied to Treshi, who is tied to the Paragon's call, who are tied to Otohun, who goes to the moon, that calls Imogen. I love this kind of stuff, and I just wish I was smart enough to figure it out. So if you have any theories, I would love to hear them in the comments below. If you haven't already, please go ahead and subscribe and like the video. Also, check out my other recaps and my album Scorpio. Thank you so much for watching. Stay safe out there. Good day, my friends. A big night in the